Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. My name is April Falcon Doss. I am the Executive Director of the Georgetown Institute for Technology, Law, and Policy. I'm joined here by my colleague and counterpart, Nicholas Guggenberger at the Yale Information Society Project. We are delighted to be continuing this series on AI governance that is co-hosted by Georgetown and Yale. And this morning's uh, conversation is around AI and corporate social responsibility. We have a fabulous and dynamic panel. And so without further ado from me, let me turn it over to our moderator, Alexander Reed Givens from the Center for Democracy and Technology. Wonderful, thank you, April. And thank you both to Georgetown and to Yale for hosting this. It's wonderful to all be together. I'm pleased to introduce my fellow panelists, and then um, I'm going to give a little bit of framing remarks to help guide the conversation. We're joined today by Yoko Arasaka of Sony, who is a general manager of the legal section in the legal department. She is joining us from Japan, which is many hours ahead of us, so we're deeply grateful to her for spending time with us on a Friday evening. We're also joined by Erica Brownlee of MasterCard, who is a senior vice president and assistant general counsel focused on global privacy and cyber advocacy, as well as privacy and data protection. And then we're joined by Yuta Williams of Twitter, who is a staffed product manager for ML ethics, transparency and accountability. Before we begin a note about the format for today, I've asked each speaker to present for up to 10 minutes and to answer two specific questions that I'll share in a moment. After that, we'll have time for some panel discussion and some audience Q&A. We're fitting a lot into an hour, so to submit questions, please do put them in the chat throughout the course of the conversation. If we have time at the end, I'll also invite people to use the raise hand function if you do want to ask questions verbally. Note that if you do that, we are recording today's session, so you'll be on screen uh, and joining us for that part of it. I'm glad we're holding this conversation today because the phrase responsible AI is on everybody's lips. At my organization, the Center for Democracy and Technology, we spend a lot of time studying examples where the use of AI in decision-making has resulted in significant unintended consequences that shape people's lives. Some common areas that advocates and increasingly lawmakers have honed in on are things like the use of AI in hiring to screen resumes or analyze and recorded videos, the use of AI to determine people's eligibility for benefits, the use of AI to detect fraud in government programs, and during the pandemic, the use of AI in exam proctoring software. Another important area in these conversations is the use of AI by law enforcement, most notably in facial recognition technology, where some models have famously been shown to be less accurate on darker skin tones. AI is also being used actively in content moderation by social media services, as we'll hear a little bit about today, as platforms grapple with just the fire hose of content that is uploaded to their services every minute. Those are just some examples, but I think what's particularly interesting about conversation is hearing from folks inside the companies about the types of uses of AI that their businesses are using and how they navigate some of the questions that arise. In each setting, the important questions are, what are the opportunities presented by this technology? And of course, what are the risks? What should companies be doing to address those risks? That then allows us to have a more informed and reasonable conversation about to what extent regulation or liability regimes are needed to ensure that companies take important steps to mitigate against risk versus softer modes of self-governance or industry codes of conduct. So I hope we'll get to a conversation of that today. To help us cut into this material in an accessible way, I've asked our speakers to answer two questions in their remarks. First, within your company, what uses of AI raise questions of AI ethics and social responsibility? And then how are you responding to those concerns? We'll begin now with the presentations and I'll pass it over to Yoko Arasaka of, so of Sony. Please, Ms. Arasaka, take it away. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Yoko Arisaka from Sony Group Corporation. It is great honor for me to be here. Today, I would like to introduce Sony's AI ethics activities. As a creative entertainment company, Sony seeks to use AI technology to unleash the potential of human creativity. For artists and creators who produce entertainment, this means supporting efforts to raise their creativity to the next rebel. And for people who enjoy entertainment, Sony aspires to transform their lifestyles. 
our AI innovations will create new culture, which brings more inspiration to people's lives. Sony is also breaking into new fields like agriculture and education with initiative for a sustainable society on the global scale. Today, I would like to introduce some examples of how Sony is developing using AI in various situations. Next slide, please. As I said, uh, Sony intends to use AI technology to expand the creativity of artists and creators in an effort to move people emotionally throughout the world. Providing new means expression enables new creative activities. For example, audio source separation, AI that you understand the characteristic of music can be used to extract and rearrange individual instruments from music that consists of a mix of sounds. This makes it possible to create multi-track data from old records. This gives artists the freedom to create new music and to give listeners musical instruments, the likes of which never existed before. Next slide, please. This is AI cooking project. This is to expand chef's creativity and explore new possibilities in cooking. We will advance the science of the five senses and create new cuisine by encouraging cooperation between humans and robots, introducing many kinds of sensing technologies to the field of cooking and promoting analysis of the senses of sight, taste, hearing, smell, and touch. Sony's AI technology will provide new forms of entertainment that make everyday life richer and more fun. Next slide, please. This is Aibo. Aibo is an autonomous entertainment robot for the home, designed to grow as it is showered with love as a member of the family. As it interacts with people, Aibo gains an understanding of them and takes part in a two-way communication of feelings with them. Next slide, please. This is real-time IAF. Autofocus. Real time autofocus makes it possible to shoot like a professional photographer with perfect focus on the eye in the split second when the subject, uh, even a challenging subject like a child on the move, turns to face the camera. Furthermore, deep learning made real time eye autofocus compatible with animals as well. Real-time eye autofocus will change your everyday life with your cameras. Next slide, please. This is Sony's purpose. Our purpose is to fill the world with emotion throughout the power of creativity and technology. To pioneer the future with dreams and curiosity, it's born from enriching people spiritually in order to do this, it is important to keep questioning what people are, what humanity is, and what we are looking for. Personally, I personally believe this is what ethics is all about. What people are, what humanity is, and what we are looking for. Next slide, please. Sony establishes the Sony Group AI Ethics Guidelines in September 2018. Sony has its Group AI Ethics Committee to ensure that our research, development, and utilization is socially and ethically appropriate according to the AI Ethics Guidelines. Next slide, please. Machine learning is a subsection of AI. It refers to a machine's ability 
to learn from data by recognizing patterns and so improve over time. What is AI black box? This is the problem of being unable to understand the processes AI uses to reach its answers. This is an issue within the development of AI and one that is prevalent in machine learning tools. We don't know exactly what they are learning. This leads to ethical problems because it's easy for machine learning AI to learn biases from data. If we don't know how or why AI reaches a conclusion, we can't know it's the right answer. And we can't fix incorrect or biased processes. Prioritizing fairness in the AI system is a challenge for us. AI systems can behave unfairly for a variety of reasons. Some social reasons, some technical reason, and a combination of both. Given the many complex sources of unfairness, it is not possible to guarantee complete fairness. Rather, the goal is to mitigate fairness-related harms as much as possible. Take Ivo for example. Next slide, please. First, on the limits of technology. There are limits to sensor-based AI recognition technology. It is not possible to recognize everything and act correctly. And Ibo's end user, it is mentioned that Ibo may not be able to recognize the situation around it correctly in some cases. Next slide, please. So illustrations are used to ensure human oversight necessary for Ibo. And second, privacy. Ibo has the feature to determine what is going on around it. Ivo picks up ambient sounds, including human voice, and learns what is going on around it through cameras and re sensors. So we think providing accessible information to individuals about the use of their personal information is a key element of legal rights to transparency. Next slide, please. Of course, it also clearly communications that sensors are included in Ivo. Privacy notice can be accessible via website before purchasing Ivo. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you. We have a very clear picture on our website to help our customers understand. Next slide, please. Uh, the difficulty is that people's sense of ethics differs according to region, culture, generation, education, and family environment. Even if you don't find a certain product, service, or content scary, people in other countries may find it scary. As a company with global operations, it is very difficult to determine what ethics we should follow. In order to operate effectively on a global scale, companies need a standard framework and guidelines at the international level. This is why Sony proactively advances a dialogue with related industries, organizations, academia, and more. And today is the best opportunity for me to learn from other companies about AI ethics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, and thanks for, for putting up with some of this background noise. I think we've managed to uh, to deal with most of it. Back, Yuta, could I ask you to go uh, next, and then we'll switch the order? Thank I'd be you. Very, I'd be very happy to. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity, and that was a fantastic first presentation, Yoko. It's a it's an honor to be on this panel with all of you, um, and thank you for letting me join. Oh. Right. Um, if it's all right, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I wanted to share um, a perspective uh, that wasn't necessarily slides based, and it was. Uh, to demonstrate the importance of uh, developing in the open and public accountability. So I wanted to start by explaining that Twitter has had for some long period of time, an internal initiative around ensuring that the ML that we use, the machine learning algorithms that we use 
to make determinations around recommendations for your home timeline, uh, for identifying and eradicating terrorism on our workspace, on our, on, our, on our platform, as well as finding toxic content. These sorts of algorithmic decision-making systems are uh, assessed for fairness and for all kinds of other potential harms. Uh, we have recently gone very public with this initiative and this company-wide initiative called Responsible ML. And it received quite a lot of uh, feedback from the community, and which was our intention and our goal. So rather than develop slides today, I thought I would go through what we are saying publicly because we are developing all of this work in the public space these days and uh, demonstrate for you how public accountability can drive some change in platforms like ours. So uh, about what has been about three weeks ago on April 14th, we announced this company-wide initiative called Responsible ML. And we suggested that there were four pillars to the work that we've been doing and that we're gonna continue to do a little bit more openly and transparently. The first is taking responsibility for the actual decisions we're making and coming forward with findings from all of the ways that we're investigating how machine learning is, is affecting people both positively and negatively on our platform. The second is to really focus on outcome and to ensure that we're sharing uh, research as well as uh, findings and investigative reporting related to how equity and fairness is, is, is implemented on our, on our platform. And uh, the third is around transparency and making sure that we're sharing this very vocally, publicly, and informatively with the, the community of interest. And we have a lot of different customers for this, sorts of, this sort of information. More and more, the public is becoming aware of how algorithms affect their daily lives. We want to be informative to the users of our platform as well as just the general public. We have a lot of regulatory interest and so we're working in partnership with a lot of agencies like um, consumer advocacy groups, uh, civil rights groups with regulatory bodies around the world. And uh, we're gonna be a lot more transparent about those conversations as well and, and how we're participating in that dialogue. And lastly, how we enable agency and algorithmic choice so that people rather than um, a one size fits all sort of algorithmic approach can inform your experiences on our platform. And these are four very uh, important initiatives that I lead as a product manager for Twitter. And I think that this is a little bit different than how other companies like mine approach these problem sets because we are a product focused organization and group. We're applied in nature and not doing just pure research. So the work we do is not necessarily marketing for a product we sell. This is very directly embedded in how we're developing product and how we're improving product every day. Um, we are going to be very open uh, with the findings that we, that, we've, that we have. Our internal team, which is called Machine Learning Ethics, Transparency and Accountability has been in place for a number of years. And we're bringing um, forward into the public uh, the work that this team has been producing. It's an interdisciplinary group that includes academic research, it includes engineering efforts to build uh, product tooling to help uh, all of our machine learning developers develop better algorithms that treat people equitably and fairly. And uh, we have a whole lot of uh, social science and other political scientists that contribute to this work as well so we can understand the social impacts of how social media and Twitter in particular as it uh, supports the public conversation is affecting society. The other a uh, piece that I would say that's a little bit different about the way that Twitter is approaching some of this uh, conversation around responsible ML is that we're making very open access to data for researchers to do external research on data uh, that is public in nature so that we can be held accountable by those who want to research the outcomes and the consequences of, of how social media is impacting society. And I, I assure you, I read those papers and while many of them identify harms, some of them also identify solutions and opportunities for us to address inequity in the world, um, especially those that are amplified by our platform. And I take those very seriously as a product manager and we incorporate those ideas. We look at uh, a number of different topics. There's the, the machine learning ethics space is incredibly broad. And uh, bias is one thing that is talked about quite pervasively, but there are many aspects and components to what in is involved in machine learning ethics. A couple of those uh, topics we're gonna to be sharing a whole lot more about. The first is on gender and racial bias, um, as was evident quite publicly in an image cropping algorithm that was highly criticized in, in the industry. I would say that back last fall, we responded to some very uh, 
public criticism of how this algorithm was treating people, especially those with darker skin tones. And we immediately went into solve mode. Uh, so we published this blog back in October, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about what's gone on since then as a product team. We researched how algorithmic bias uh, was assessed in 2017 when this algorithm first launched. We took a look at what was done well and what was done poorly in that original assessment. We took a look at the original data that was used to train that model. We replicated a lot of the findings, um, and then we also identified new biases that had crept into uh, the, the algorithmic response. We worked with product to remove all of that, uh, that algorithm in the short term. And uh, a product called uh, Edge to Edge, which was a feature rollback of that image crop algorithm launched uh, worldwide yesterday. And it allowed us to remove this automated cropping that was uh, artif artificially deamplifying um, specific types of faces in, 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 the, in the auto crop. It was based on a saliency model that was trained on human perception. And so we've removed the algorithm while we look at ways to provide people more control over cropping in general. And to follow up on the promises that we made last October, we'll also be releasing the research and the reproducible code to, uh, to prove our research <laughs> and allow other people to uh, reproduce our research um, in the next two weeks. This is how we're demonstrating this promise to be more transparent and more inclusive and to include the, the public in how we approach these problems. So I would, I would suggest that I wanted to share with you this public blog, blog post because it was a little bit uh, concerning to release this much information about an internal initiative, but we felt it was very important for us to be sharing publicly what we're doing and our approaches so that the public can hold us accountable. Um, I would also suggest that uh, in, in, in coming months, you'll also see a whole bunch of uh, additional research that we're doing around our home timeline and how we're assessing that for bias and fairness, um, especially in recommendations and amplification. And we've also been uh, doing a lot of deep dive on how political parties and political ideologies are treated on platform. And with uh, a lot of data not accessible to outside parties, we wanted to deliver some data insights that would help ex fuel external research. And so this is, this is part of our approach to being much more transparent, more inclusive with uh, the research community. Lastly, I would like to just emphasize the importance of working with governments. Um, oops, that's not it. <laughs> Apologies there. Um, we are actively participating in debates in Congress in the United States, as well as with other government agencies around the world. It's super important for us to have uh, uh, a, the opportunity to share our perspective uh, with, with the people who are most critical. We provide a lot of down, uh, testimony. I would say that our testimony um, is very uh, detailed compared to some of our competitors, and we share a lot of perspective around how important it is for us to be accountable to government agencies. We're going to talk a lot more about self-governing um, models, and we're going to talk a lot more today, I understand, about how governance in general might be applied to AI and government systems, where we embrace that opportunity. And I think in the last testimony, we're the only ones who said that we believe that GDPR in the US would not be such a bad thing. Um, and I would also say that we are in agreement with a lot of the new guidance coming out of other enforcement agencies like the FTC that I call for uh, equity as part of uh, consumer promise. And I would highlight especially that ethical principles like the golden mean are directly applicable to some of the regulatory frameworks that we're, that we're looking to comply with. So I look forward to more conversation, um, Alexandra. I hope that uh, this gave you a little fuel for the follow-up conversations. And I will try to be under the 10 minute mark by passing the baton back. Wonderful, thank you. Erica, go ahead. I don't know how to stop. <laughs> There. Can you hear me? Oh, okay, because it just sounded like, I, I'm sorry, I was trying to get off of mute there. All right, let me just share my screen. Let's see if that works. Okay. Let's hope that that works. I don't know if people can see my screen. Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so um, thank you, uh, Alex, and also, of course, to uh, Georgetown Tech Net Working Group and um, the Yale School of uh, Information Product Society Project, if, I, if I'm getting that uh, 
a title right for organizing the panel um, to frame up my comments around AI ethics and social responsibility. I wanted to start off with our, our approach to general, uh, you know, more generally to data responsibility. And whether it's AI or biometrics or connected devices, at the end of the day, it comes down to trust uh, for us. Trust that we as providers of products and services to consumers will be good stewards of their personal information. So at MasterCard, our journey has been guided by a commitment to data ethics and to um, world-class privacy and security standards. And we made this commitment um, public in the form of a data responsibility initiative. Let's see if I can actually do my slide. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that serves, and this data responsibility uh, initiative or imperative serves as our North Star in representing the notion that individuals have rights around how their data is used. And then uh, on the flip side, that ethical entities have certain responsibilities to ensure that individuals and their rights are honored. And so um, it really breaks down uh, very simply and straightforwardly, straightforward uh, into um, four different categories, right? That individuals should own their own data, that individuals should have a right to control and understand how their data is used and shared. So we don't share personal information without consent or unless uh, legally permitted, for example, for fraud, purposes. Um, third, that individuals should benefit from the use of their data and that individuals should have their right to keep the, their data private and secure. Uh, and then on the, on the flip side, as I was mentioning, MasterCard has committed to a set of data principles to which we hold ourselves accountable. Uh, privacy and security, uh, it, as you see there, um, and by that we commit to best in class uh, you know, privacy and security practices. Uh, with regard to transparency and control, we commit to providing clear and simple explanations for how we collect, share, and use personal information. With respect to accountability, again, that's keeping individuals at the center uh, of what we do and making sure that we do what we uh, commit to, to doing. Uh, with respect to integrity, their, um, that commitment is a deliberate and thoughtful approach to minimization of bias. We just heard a discussion of that uh, and uh, inaccuracies as well as unintended harm caused by uh, or with respect to use of personal information. And you know, I'll come back to bias in a minute. Uh, it, with respect to innovation, pursuing data innovation uh, that, that benefits individuals through better products and services uh, is what that refers to. And then that leads into the social impact piece, which is to identify those opportunities to positively impact society. So these principles serve as our North Star, uh, as I mentioned, with regard to data design and application for AI at MasterCard so that we are able to keep our practices uh, you know, ethical um, and with individual at, individuals at the center. And so we've developed uh, privacy guidelines as well as an AI governance framework that translates those specific principles into actionable steps and application. So I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, so the framework includes evaluation phases for um, purpose as well as data and specific use case. Uh, and then uh, that also leads to our data model design and uh, our scorecard, as well as on the output side, looking to build the uh, uh, model and then do an assessment uh, as first as a, um, on the soft launch and then uh, you know, on the model once it goes into production. So I wanna just focus on four inflection points with respect to our framework. Um, I won't go 
through all of them, but um, I, I do want to say, and then we'll come back to, to best practices, that we have an AI council that includes the chief privacy officer, as well as the chief data officer and chief security officer, in addition to senior representatives from business teams and data scientists. And that sets the overall strategy for AI and risk tolerance. Uh, and it also reviews high risk data, uh, so, or high risk solutions um, and how we can work through that from a data perspective. Um, second, we have a working group that reports to the AI Council and um, reviews medium risk solutions while monitoring and looking for ways to improve. Third, we do have a scorecard which is our, our internal standard for scoring risk, as I mentioned on the previous panel, a uh, previous slide. And then we have the data design model. And that's where we really get into um, describing the data and the steps taken to minimize bias. We touched on bias on the, with our, um, earlier in the panel, so I won't go through all of these um, aspects and all of the, the types of bias, but I, I, I would just offer a few comments for um, observation. And that is that, you know, even before the events of 2020, um, individuals were really on a trajectory of incorporating more and more digital information um, and, uh, and programming uh, from a volume perspective across the ecosystem. And as a result, organizations were collecting increasingly more information. And so um, the pandemic, that was before 2020, but of course the pandemic just re-accelerated that trend, but it also you know, changed patterns as we know. And um, you know, not everyone had the same access to digital platforms. So it sort of um, you know, potentially exacerbated that digital divide. So from the perspective of AI, and you know, I, I note on there um, selection bias, for example, which is when you're you know not taking that representative uh, sample appropriately um, to reflect the population. Um, data that was collected, for example, in 2019 looked a lot different from data collected in 2020. So, and of course, that'll you know change from um, this year and to 2021. And so, it could impact the the type of um, sample data could also um, have an impact on latent bias, which relies on that recent historical uh, data and can really distort the, the algorithmic outcomes, particularly for uh, you know, diverse groups of people, uh, you know, race and gender included in that, in those groupings. Um, and then those changes, again, from um, 2020 can, can have an impact on model drift because uh, you know, of that uh, particular event. Uh, so as you can see from the bottom of the slide, you know, what we contemplate, uh, and this is sort of broad, just best practices, how to adjust and mitigate for those um, potential biases. And I think it was very interesting, you know, you talked about fairness um, as a key part and, and um, you know, it came up earlier because that's one of the key um, aspects of, of for taking into uh, account when you set out the, the outcome. Unfortunately, there are a lot of different definitions for fairness and it's not consistent, but it is important for organizations to um, look and approach that from um, you know, organic consistent way so that as you're defining the model, as you're road testing, as you're monitoring for drift and for other types of biases, that is accounted um, in that fairness context. And then of course, all of this is you know, within, the, within the lens of a um, you know, assessment of risk um, because not all models are the same and nor should all of the mitigation strategies be the same. So I'll, I'll stop there um, just, to, just to sort of say though that um, in addition to the FTC, we're seeing you know, uh, more, obviously more um, regulations come uh, on board. And so whether it's best practices or uh, other ways in which 
you know, companies are looking at, uh, you know, organizing and operating their AI systems, there may be legally required steps as we see, you know, um, coming across, for example, with Europe and the AI uh, proposed regulation. And so that too is a risk-based approach, but, you know, as that moves through the process and, you know, eventually um, potentially becomes, uh, you know, operational companies, that operate multinationally and touch Europe will have to, you know, adjust their practices accordingly. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Wonderful, Erica, thank you. And thank you to all of the speakers. Um, I'm gonna ask just a couple of questions. And of course the audience is free to begin putting them in the chat as well. One of the first things that I'm really interested about in this space is how principles are operationalized in practice. You, know, you can write a, a good statement of company guidance. I think that's an important thing for setting the tone about how an organization is looking at these issues. But a lot of this is about actually getting it down to the product team level, both at the point of design, but also kind of in terms of ongoing accountability. As we think about more dynamics in this space, how we get more companies to engage on these questions, I would love your perspective on whether decisions about ethical AI implementing these frameworks really do make sense at a company level, if there's utility for cross industry guidance and practices um, and, and what that means in terms of trying to shape industry behavior kind of by thinking about cross industry principles versus just companies having to do the hard work internally as well. I'll open that up to any of the panelists. Oh, Yuta, we can't hear you. Nick, are you able to use your hosting capacity to get her unmuted? I, I'm unmuted now, thank you. Um, I think we had to mute everyone because of a few bad apples. So um, so I, I, I should give a little context for my answer. Um, the first is that I'm a recovering compliance officer and um, I'm also a recovering privacy officer for some pretty large systems and they were health related integrated health systems. So I, the, the framework and the governance structure and everything we, that others have spoken about are critically important to helping companies build and, uh, and address the right types of business principles that for, for which AI is applied. I'd rather not talk about those um, personally because I, I worked for 20 years building those governance systems and implementing those kinds of controls. And uh, we had a saying in, in medical profession that uh, your processes are perfectly designed for the outcomes you enjoy. I don't love the outcomes of having built those regulatory frameworks for either security or privacy. I think we built an incredible industry around compliance. It's a $35 billion industry to build compliance frameworks that don't necessarily really help people. I think they help companies and they help governments hold companies liable. And this is a law school <laughs> presentation, so I have to acknowledge that that is what we're here to discuss. I would rather talk about the principles that help people um, and be safer in exchanging information and, and receiving services from companies fueled and powered by AI. That's what I do these days. So from a principles basis, I think that there are some principles that should be uniform across industry. And this is what we tried to build uh, when, we, when we talk with cross industry partnerships like AI partnership or working with some consumer groups like even yours, um, Alexandra, is understanding what people need uniformly in order for them to be safe psychologically as well as physically in a world that's driven by AI. Those principles should be codified and those principles should be applied uniformly. The methodology um, from how to, for how you regulate <laughs> um, every industry in the world who's using a new technology that's going to be as pervasive as electricity, if you believe Andrew Ning, uh, is, is a little bit of a, of a stretch. <laughs> So I would, I would suggest that we focus on the principles of how, what outcomes people want to enjoy and how people should be treated in a society that's largely online these days more than we do principles for how we apply governance to companies. So I'll pause there. Erica or Yoko, would you like to, to weigh in on that? And I think one of the pieces that is important to me in this conversation is how do we bring along the entire frame of industry, right? There are always gonna be some company leaders that really do lean into this, but I think that the, some of the benefits of cross company efforts are that it brings along some of the stragglers as well. So I'd love if you could address that piece in, in answering the question. 
I don't know if anyone else wants to to sort of jump in, but no, I think it's I think it's a very good question. I think that um, you know when you look across uh, you know the, the landscape, there are a lot of different approaches. I think the challenge is that you know AI is used for a lot of different things and and in different sectors, and so you know finding commonality and convergence um, is a challenge. And, uh, you know, but at the same time, you know, agreeing with you to there's some there's some foundational fundamental principles. And that's really the approach that we took, even with developing our data initiative um, and imperative, because I think that there are sort of, you know, fundamental uh, areas where we will see agreement and approach. And everybody, I think, you know, comes from a perspective that you want robust models that actually do work to mitigate um, the bias and the and um, you know outcomes that are not as we intended um, but you know having a um, a broad-based approach I think does does present um, challenges to go more granularly uh, so you know if it's possible uh, you know to sort of start almost from, um, you know, a higher level and then um, work from there. That's sort of where, you know, we might might be able to, to gather um, consensus and momentum. There are lots of, of, of you know, groups, including um, from the academic uh, uh, area, as well as uh, some of the think tanks that are really putting a lot of effort into um, the thought leadership here. And I think we can borrow from, you know, all of those environments to try to create a standard that not only what I'd like to see is not only something though that is, um, you know, uh, just from a principle step, but also that can be operationalized. Otherwise we sort of, we don't move forward. Um, and then you can kind of use the, the use cases like against that. Um, so, you know, that's, that's sort of where I am. I know it's a bit, it's, it's, it's a bit more general, um, but, uh, and, uh, you know, I do have the privacy lens you, you to, so I know you're, you're recovered, but I <laughs> that, that I, I would be remiss without sort of, you know, making sure that this part of, of, um, of these principles and this approach definitely incorporates those privacy uh, driven principles. So, you know, from the perspective of, you know, minimization from the perspective of, and when I say minimization, I don't just mean, you know, collecting less data, but also using, thinking of ways, privacy enhancing technologies, thinking of ways where you're reducing the use and reliance on identifiable information, whether that's through, um, you know, anonymization, or encryption or other types of obfuscation where you're adding noise to the data doesn't affect uh, the value um, and the ability to extract the outcome, but it does reduce the, the, the privacy implications. Um, Yuta, I was so glad that in your remarks, you talked about researcher access to data. Um, for CDT, my organization, that's a hugely important point as we think about algorithmic accountability and the important role that the outside community can play in helping to understand what potential harms might be and how to mitigate them. I'm curious, either for Yoko or for Erica, how you think about your relationship with the research community thinking about um, algorithmic accountability, and in particular how that layers into the kind of the very common conversations happening right now about third party audits for algorithmic systems as an important way to look for and mitigate harms. Yoko, why don't we start with you. Yes, thank you very much. That is a very good question. And um, we have some um, um, we have built up a technological tools and data sets with academia, such as an explainable AI, which makes visible how machine learning works and systems that protect against malicious attacks. So we are offering some of these technologies as solutions to external partners. And one of them is the Neutral Neural Network Console, a tool that makes possible um, to external partners and uh, the development of advanced AI through deep learning, no coding necessary. And uh, the net neural network console enables deep learning R&D sim simply by dragging and dropping on the computer. And 
by using that technology and R&D, uh, it is very easy to audit that kind of, uh, to find the AI ethics problems. So I think it is very important to uh, cooperation with R&D and academia and to find a solution to how to uh, easily find an AI ethics issues by audit state and after monitoring state. Erica, how about for you? Obviously, um, the, the financial services industry is highly scrutinized, something that people pay a lot of attention to because of its impact on people's lives. I'd love to hear your take on this question. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, I'm unmuted. <laughs> Sorry, I put myself on mute and I didn't realize I was still there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that it is, you know, this is a, a very good question um, in terms of, you know, working with uh, the, from the academic approach. First of all, it's an iterative loop, right? Like the, the, the development um, in, in this field, I think is critically, um, you know, improved by, looking towards um, the academic field to, to see how not only we can um, make the systems more robust, but also to you know, work through those mitigations. Um, with respect to uh, research standards, I think that it comes up in, in, in two places. First of all, when I was talking about bias earlier, I think it's really important to vet the, uh, the particular types of um, variables against those, you know, as I was saying, those research standards to make sure that 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 they are capturing um, uh, the you know the latest um, development, so that that is um, it's an iterative improvement to the model, but it needs to be vetted against the the you know the current um, research standards. So we do that. There there are um, several products on the Mastercard side that. Uh, that specifically are designed to, to use AI. One of them is um, in a product that it, it was, um, it's under a, a brand called Briterian where you know, they use uh, AI models to uh, help in the healthcare space, for example, to help root out um, fraud, waste and abuse. And they work with clients to do that using their own data um, where they're really, uh, you know, the process involves a, a fairly rigorous um, six to eight week uh, process to actually work through um, the testing. And part of that would be, uh, you know, part of that rigorous testing would be vetting against um, standards, research standards. We have a question here from um, Anupam Chander in the chat asking, because you're all global companies, how are you seeking to ensure that AI is trained to deal with different cultures and languages, I'll layer on that kind of different governance environments as well. Um, Yuda, why don't we start with you? Yeah, we do business in a lot of countries. In fact, in my past lives, I worked at both Google and Facebook where you know we had 138 countries, which includes their jurisdictions as well as their people that we serve. Uh, it's very important to think internationally as you're developing AI. And this is an act a terribly myopic thing uh, to, to miss as an as a AI development firm. 80% uh, of our users are actually outside the United States. Uh, so it's imperative that when you create representational uh, data sets for training purposes that you consider your international users in those data sets. It also requires you to build a whole lot more AI. So when you're building, say, a, um, an anti-trafficking uh, detector, <laughs> right? You have to do that in a lot of languages, and which means that you have to have data labeling from lots of languages and you have to have participants and developers and developer um, communities in lots of countries. So being a multinational corporation means developing where people are or empowering third-party um, service providers to help power your AI with uh, contextual language and other uh, cultural um, inputs that, that would be relevant internationally. So it's very expensive to build AI well. It's very important that you build AI well because you wanna create delightful features for everyone. Um, and you also wanna protect everyone. So 100% we do that. Um, the political variance paper I was speaking of earlier does consider seven countries uh, and uh, how political parties and ideology are use Twitter uh, to um, 
uh, in rhetoric in, in their conversation that they lead in in many countries because it's important to look um, very internationally. So yes, we do that. Uh, we do release data to anybody who wants to do research. So you can research how Twitter and the social conversations that we host um, affect your countries uh, very directly. I guess I'll pause there. Wonderful, Eric, I'll go to you next. And I'd love to layer in this question, given the fact that so many companies are multinational these days or dealing with these questions in many ju different jurisdictions, what is the role or the benefit or the costs of increasing harmonization or collaboration between governments as they think about these questions? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, and, and I know we're talking about it in the context of AI, uh, but you know, frankly, it's something that uh, for multinationals we deal with, you know, across our products and services, right? That that, that operate in different countries. Um, so it, it it's something that you know, sort of, I think everyone has to kind of uh, you know understand and accommodate for um, the differences in languages and cultures. Um, as you two was saying, one of the things I'll throw in there is that some countries require um, on soil. Uh, you know, data to, you know, they have on-soil requirements. In other words, that the data has to remain on soil. So you are local. And um, so, you know, you have to operate locally under, under localization requirements. So I think it, it you know, it requires um, flexibility and agility. Uh, and um, as we were saying, you know, meeting the needs uh, of consumers I would also say that for MasterCard, we sit in a little bit different uh, place in the ecosystem because most, while we are B2C, a lot of what we do is B2B. So the context that I was just talking about with um, our work with uh, you know, customers to detect fraud, waste, and, and abuse in healthcare or just fraud in general, that's generally with, with customers um, who then uh, you know, further interact with consumers. So the point that was just raised about understanding how, you know, the, the, um, you know, how we work with third parties, how we work with parties and they work um, with uh, third parties, I think is, is also critical. And, um, and generally, right, whether required or not, um, when it comes to our data practices, we're looking to make sure that our data um, is protected in the same way and, and accessed in the, um, in the same way that, that uh, we would as, uh, as the originator, if we are in fact, right? <laughs> and the way MasterCard sits, we're not always, right? We facilitate payments and, and we're not always um, the controller or the originator of the data. Yoko, I'd love to turn to you next. We are, you are living the principle of international collaboration right now, joining us from across the globe. Um, but how does Sony think about this role of being compliant in so many different countries, trying to acknowledge different cultural values, and language barriers as you develop your product responsibly? Yeah, one of the most complex steps in considering AI bias is understanding and measuring fairness. And conflicting views can often arise. One person's fear is another person's unfair and different fairness definition cannot be satisfied at the same time. So uh, even if we can agree what is fair, uh, how we should, uh, is well, how should the address, uh, issue be addressed? First is multi-discipline, multinational teams, assemble a team of individuals covering multi disciplines and covering uh, a lot of countries. And Second is education and transparency, provide information how the algorithms work and consider confidentiality and IP protection and ensure all employees, all employees all over the world understand how the tool works and audit, audit algorithms and examine the inputs, outputs and outcomes in a scientific way to ensure um, they are working as intended. I love that point, Yoko. If I could just tack on just a tiny bit. One of my um, volunteer jobs was as the US chair to ISO for AI standards at one point. And it was when we first started looking at building technical standards around artificial intelligence. And there was a pretty heated debate around the, the word fair um, and, and whether or not you could use the word fair or fairness mm -hmm. in relationship to any technical standard around AI because fairness inherently is an ethical consideration and it's gonna, and it varies by culture very substantially. So when you talk about building technical standards about what's fair, 
and, and versus what's biased, for example. Bias is calculatory. You can actually quantify what is bias in an algorithm and whether that expands um, bias that is also uh, visible in society, right? Um, but fair is a, is a moral judgment. And I think every company should develop an ethical, eth some sort of ethos, an ethical baseline for what they consider to be a, a, a line. Now we have done that at Twitter very visibly and very um, critically about what we as, as the owner of a property feel is a, a, a correct use of our platform and technology. That is a very hard thing for every company to assess. And it takes people who are trained in ethics, people who are trained in the law and people who um, are willing to, to, to fight the good fight to, de de to decide what is fair and equitable. And I think that that is probably the most important thing that I can, I can share at this presentation is that all of these technical measures, all of these governance structures, everything else comes down to somebody making a decision about what's ethical, what is fair, and where your company wants to place its brand and its image. And I, I think I'll, I'll just drop mic there. Thank you. I'm going to use moderator's prerogative to ask you all one question and to say very unfairly that I need to have quick answers from you. It's almost like a house hearing, right? I'm not going to say yes or no answers, but <laughs> relatively brief. Obviously, this is a law school uh, event today, so we do think about uh, the role for policymaking and, and legislation. We have a new administration, a new Congress, all of which are trying to think about what their imprint will be on this industry at a really important turning point for the growth of AI through the use of many, through many different industries. As the new administration comes in and staffs, staffs up, what do you hope they have top of mind in their approach to AI governance over the next four years? Again, very big question with a request for short answers. Erica, I'd love to start with you. <laughs> okay. Um, I think the one thing that just to sort of focus on, and, and you're absolutely right that this is something that's coming up in, in our, uh, you know, on this side of the pond, there's also a request for information from the banking agencies, they're thinking about regulation and AI. I think the most important thing is innovation, right, like to not let the benefits of AI sort of, you know, be, uh, you know, overcome and swamped by what the you know, what the risks are, um, you know, part of the reason where, you know, I think entering a new stage, even with the pandemic was the ability to share data and work quickly and use, um, you know, uh, uh, models to develop, right, treatments. And so that's probably where I would go is that I think, you know, we, we've talked a lot about bias and fairness, those that all needs to be in there and transparency. I can't be a privacy lawyer without talking about transparency every five minutes, but um, you know I think that's all important. But I also need to. I, I, I just think there needs to be recognition about the innovative and value add of of um, of AI. That's what I'd say. Yoko. Yes, I think. Um... I think that either self-regulatory approaches and government regulation is fine as long as it encourages, as Erica said, uh, encourage the development of AI technology that is acceptable to society. The laws and regulations clarify how to allocate the liabilities and increases predictability, allowing companies to send out their products and services uh, with confidence. This is especially true for, for example, self-driving cars. So governments need to protect the public harm public from harm, while companies need to responsible responsibility for their social obligations. So the public and the private sector should collaborate to each other when using mechanisms such as co-created regulation and where appropriate self-regulation if it is best to get trust from people. In any case, technological developments and people's behaviors and ways of thinking fluctuate greatly. For example, COVID-19 changes the world dramatically. So the agile and the responsive regulation will be crucial in the post-pandemic world. Business models are changing rapidly and regulation will need to keep pace with, the, with um, these changes without stifling innovations. Yuda, you get to close us out. Oh my goodness. Um... I think that uh, I, I am a fan of regulatory oversight. I am a fan for defined criteria and I am a fan of, of baseline um, lines that should be drawn by society to govern, uh, especially in the social media world, uh, what constitutes harmful 
um, outcomes for people. Uh, I'm, I may be a bit of a skeptic. I, I spend a really long time in my career trying to implement regulatory frameworks that are, are self-regulating in nature. And uh, my favorite quote is that self uh, wolves self-regulate for the good of the pack, not for the good of the herd. And I, 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 I emphasize that as a point because self-regulating frameworks are easy to navigate as, as a corporation. And you, we, we as consumers need to choose brands that take that responsibility very seriously and don't try to circumvent the intentions of those regulatory frameworks. And I think that I've spent a career implementing these self-regulating frameworks at companies that were dedicated to doing better and, and, and using their technology to, to make society better. I'm, I'm not sure that anything I've seen represented as a new regulatory framework is actually new or that will actually change how AI is being developed today. I think that we need to build awareness and you think, think we need to build entropy and I think we need to build commitment um, to being better developers of machine learning and not just focus on, on regulatory frameworks that create liability structures that are easily navigated. Wonderful. Well, with that, I'll wrap. Thank you to all of our panelists today. Thanks to our audience for joining us. Um, and again, thank you both to Georgetown and to Yale for hosting this wonderful session. It's been great to take part. Thank you. Bye, all. Thank you. Alex, thank you so much for organizing, uh, for, uh, for moderating. This was fantastic. Thank you for sailing us through uh, this, uh, through these these rough waters. Um, to everybody, thank you for joining and please do join us again uh, for our next panel in our series, um, AI Governance uh, Virtual Symposium. Next time it will be about how do we regulate AI, a comparative perspective on May 28th. Um, and with that, have a wonderful Friday, have a good weekend as soon as possible. And I would like the uh, panelists and the organizers to br briefly stay on here, if at all possible, but everybody else um, enjoy, enjoy your free time, enjoy the weekend. <laughs>